Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Winkler again, coming to you on a recording about the First World War class. I hope that uh, everything's going well. I do have my typical apology to make. By the way, this is lecture number 13. The last time I recorded was lecture number 12. Lecture number 12, I made my usual mistakes. I did watch this again after I was through and saw my typical mistakes. At one point, I said British when I, made, when I meant German. Unfortunately, I don't really know how to uh, cure my brain aneurysms. And nonetheless, uh, hopefully in context, that's not too confusing. <clears throat> Last time we were talking about the war at sea, and I made a big I went into a big discussion about the Lusitania. <clears throat> Let me just repeat a small amount of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, there's a number of, of uh, controversies. We're back up here. Controversies. A couple of things I probably should have mentioned, which kind of slipped my mind before. One of which is, why did all the people die? Well, of course, a lot of them drowned. But there's a lot of people that were unable to get into the boats that are in life vests floating in the water. When this happened with the Titanic in 1912, the water was about 28 degrees. They froze to death in, in very rapid, very rapidly they froze. So the death rates was, was high and almost everybody's in the water. What happened to the people in the water after the Lusitania? Well, they froze to death as well. Now, the temperature of the water is in the 50s. You say, well, that's not going to kill you like 28. No, it's not. But in reality, that's cold enough water that if you're in water for two hours, you will die. What's the controversy about this is the signal, of course, was sent out immediately when she was hit. Um, but the British on the coast of Ireland, essentially, from ports like Cork, were slow to react. I don't know if this was intentional. I really doubt that it was. But the fact that they were at least incompetent in this level, they were slow to react, meant that the opportunity to save lives uh, was quite diminished because too many people died before they got there. Another issue is this. <clears throat> In the 1960s, when diving technology had gotten to the point where you could go down and look at wrecks, as you all know, when the Titanic was discovered, that they had little submersibles and they went down, robotics. And it's way, way, way underneath the ocean. With that technology, they're able to literally go around and see what was left of the wreck. Now, in the 1960s, diving technology is very advanced. Certainly somebody is going to take a robotic down there and look at the Lusitania, see what else you can find out. Um, this was done later on. But in the meantime, the British Navy decided they're going to run some drills on dropping death charges. So the British Navy went over and they dropped a large number of death, death charges onto the wreck of Lusitania. Can we say, therefore, destroying a lot of potential evidence as to what happened to the vessel. Now, despite the damage that was done, submersibles have gone down and looked through the wreck. Yeah, the, the, the British were unable to obliterate it, so there's still quite a bit there. They got inside and they found, well, some things that were long. And we're not sure if they were telegraph poles, doubtful. Some people say they were artillery pieces, because obviously you can see the tube right there. Um, once again, this is slightly controversial. People are saying there's more than one possible explanation as to what these things were. But I already mentioned, we do know she was carrying munitions. Was she carrying guns as well? Any of it. There's a big outcry. It almost leads to war. The Americans are furious. And Wilson reiterates, President Wilson Reiterates, I'll say it right, reiterates his statement of neutrality. 
He wants you to be neutral in deed and in thought. That's pretty hard to pull off. Sometimes he said I was too proud to fight. Okay, he doesn't want to get involved in the war. But this is an issue that's going to rancor many Americans. When other issues come up to that end up provoking the Americans, they're able to look at the animosity which is already established from the sink of the Lusitania and use that with other issues to get the Congress to declare war. Well, that's down the road a little bit. Let's take a look at what's happening right here. We've been bouncing around a little bit. We essentially left the Western Front after the Christmas truce. But the Western Front is now being constructed in a very real sense. We don't just have slit trenches or narrow trenches or road cuts when people were, get, were going down country lanes and dodging behind the earth. Now we're digging in a very, very elaborate system of trenches. Let's take a look at the Western Front. Any old map that will take us down to Switzerland? Not quite, but I can get you close. How about that one? Not big enough. That's a little bit better. Now remember the Swiss border is right down here. There is going to be some shifting. There's going to be attacks. There's going to be counterattacks. As going back over this map, perhaps, you can see, and this is some of the attacks in 1918, which we'll discuss later on in the course. You see the Germans push out here at a considerable distance. So I'm not saying that it's completely, back to a bit better map, that it's completely static because there are shifts over a four-year period. But most of the time, you're actually dug in in an area along here. This map would probably be about 1917. This map is a little bit, so what happened in 1917, we'll come back to this, is that, well, wrong map is the Germans abandoned this area right here. So it's so the actual, at that point, the Germans withdrew, so the line of the Western Front shifts over in this direction. And we'll talk about this later on. The Western Front, as established already in 1914, is about 475 miles. Now, if you were to hop in a plane and fly directly to Switzerland from here, a direct line, this probably would not be that that far. But look at the front itself. It runs, it doesn't go directly to Switzerland. It simply goes to the North Sea up here. Remember, a small part of this is in Belgium. But the remainder is in France, a little piece down here that's in Germany, but it's really down here. So you run down here. Um, <clears throat> remember I talked to you earlier so when we're going to see major attacks, you do have a tendency to attack into a bulge. So there's going to be combat along here with the British and the French, particularly in 1916, are going to pull major offenses because look at the bulge right here. This is a good place to attack. This is also going to bait the French in 1917 to making an, one of a number of numerous mistakes in the war of attacking right in here. We'll come back later. Another issue, of course, is this right here. You see, if you were Germans and you wanted to attack someplace, remember attacking into the bulge is a pretty good idea. So we got the Somme going this direction, and we have Verdun, Battle of Verdun, going in this direction. So we're talking about 745 miles, roughly. Some books will say 450. Some books will say 500. Can I say most books would say 745 miles? Man, that is a long distance. That's farther from Salt Lake City than to Las Vegas. It's, it's hundreds of miles. North Sea, the Swiss border. When you get down to the Swiss border, the Swiss are watching their borders. And they have their armies up on the border to make sure neither the Germans nor the Allies want to come in and invade their territory. But the fortifications really end at the Swiss border. If you just took a trench 
and you dug that like a ditch all the way up over here, well, 475 miles. Of course, there's got to be a French trench and a German trench, and so you'd have to double that number. However, one thing we should not over overlook is the trenches it, are a complex of trenches. You don't just have one trench on one side and one trench on the other side. Very often you have what we would largely call defense in depth. It is not uncommon to have a frontline trench, sometimes not heavily manned. The second line of trench might be actually the bulwark of your defenses. But you have a first trench, a second trench, third trench, fourth trench, and very often five trenches. So if your enemy happens to assault your area, they're going to have to do a considerable amount of fighting to get beyond the trench system. And that's extremely difficult to do. In fact, nobody succeeds in doing this till the Germans in 1918. For the bulk of the war, you're really in the trenches. So, and the trenches also are not straight. I'll talk more about zigzag in just one minute. Let's come down here. Once again, depends on which book you want to read. <clears throat> Some books say, well, if you add up all the trenches. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the support trenches. You have trench here, trench here, trench here, trench here. But you have to bring up supplies. You have to bring out wounded men. When you rotate men in and out, you have to have supply trenches. Going back to a rail junction, more likely if you're Germans. Going back to a truck depot, more likely if you're French. And you don't want to just have guys walking up to the front, hopping in the trenches because they're, they're subject to attack. Now, usually when you move in and out of the trenches is at nighttime, so they really can't see you. On the other hand, there's listening posts. <clears throat> you really don't want to have people walking out in the open because they're subject to artillery bombardment. So you have trenches going up to the trench system and leading a number of those. Most of these dug by hand. Of course, this is starting in 1914. There's machinery that digs trenches, sometimes for pipes, sometimes for ditches, for irrigation, that kind of thing, sometimes for drainage off the land. Machinery is available. Well, are you going to bring machinery up to a, to a, to, to a trench which can be viewed by your enemy and it can put shells on it? Somewhat, this is done. Usually, you bring them up at night, and sometimes you use some of your machinery and some of the more distant trenches farther back, including the trenches that come up to the front. So, I'm going to say everything's dug by hand. But can we say mostly? The vast majority is dug by hand. The guy with the pick and shovel. Um, you dig these out. Uh, of course, sometimes they're very, sometimes they're elaborate, sometimes they're not so elaborate. The Germans have the idea that they're going to be on the defensive. They want to hold in the west, remember, and hit in the east. They wouldn't mind staying there a little while longer. Their, their, their system can be elaborate. I mean, sometimes they, they literally have concrete bunkers that go down underneath the ground. <clears throat> so you can go down there, you're encased in concrete. Even a heavy shelling, quite frankly, won't, won't bother you too much. We usually say that if you're down five meters, what's that, 18 feet? If you're down five meters below the ground, whatever the bombardment is above you will not go down and hurt you, particularly if you're encased in concrete. And sometimes these guys have record players. Sometimes they have artificial lighting. Uh, I'm not going to say this is like a hotel. I'm not going to say this is comfort. But the Germans are systems are, tend to be more elaborate because they're planning on staying longer. Now, go across the trench lines to the French and to the British. You see, they want to prosecute the war. France clearly wants to throw the Germans off the sacred soil of France. And the British and French commanders have a tendency to think that it is a little bit defeatist if you're just sitting there digging in and waiting to be attacked because they want to have the ability to continue to move and to strike. This is not saying that their trench system 
is not elaborate. Remember, it's still four and five trench deep, trenches deep. But in certain senses, it's not quite as elaborate as are the Germans. Zigzag. I mentioned this when we were talking about the Marne. Remember, overnight, the Germans had dug this slit trench. They thought it would protect them from French fire. Uh, but it was a straight trench, straight line. The next morning, the French put a machine gun on that trench, and there's like 500 German troops there. Killed like 450 of them. Just literally mowed them down. You see the problems, therefore, with a straight trench. You can control a piece of it, and you can control the entire trench. So what we want is a zigzag pattern. Well, let's see, probably not what I'm looking for. Yeah, not quite. This is actually in the trench. I would like to get an area view. Look down on them, give you a better idea as the complex. This is what I want to see. What, what I'd like to show you anyway. You can see what's happening here. You see that there are levels of trenches. Well, there's three in that area, one, two, three, four down this area. And then, of course, you have your enemies. I'm not exactly sure, but I believe this, these are German trenches. And I believe these are British trenches. Do not hold me to that. Can you see, I hopefully you can, that these are zigzag? See if I can maybe get another one. And that's not quite as good. Well, you can see that there is a zigzag pattern. Notice it essentially, I mean, zigzag is technically this, isn't it? And that does happen. Notice the support trenches. They are a tendency to be a bit more zigzag. But what we have here is we have going up like this, you see? In doing that, if uh, your enemy, the British come over here and get a hold of this little section of trench right here, they'll only control that much. You certainly cannot control all of this. Therefore, if the British were attacking you and they came across over here, they would have to literally take each section of these individually. So rather than be able to control the line, you have to take a position right here, and then you'd literally have to conquer each little section of the trench. Because of the zigzag, zigzag pattern, boy, I wish I'd get that a little bit larger. Not helpful. Because of the zigzag pattern, you do have a small front that's facing your enemy. But the connection between this section, part of the zigzag, is a little trench that goes back in this direction. If it goes back a little bit, that area is actually at a 90 degree angle to your opposing trenches. So you can be subject to fire. If you're moving these areas, it, it's a good idea to move pretty fast. Now, there might be a sniper up there. There might be an observer saying, they're moving around, guys, calling artillery, calling mortar rounds. Talk about zigzag, support trenches, and lines of trenches. No Man's Land is probably the most infamous, shall we say, famous, if you want to call it that, famous part of the Western Front. This is the land between the trenches. No Man's Land means not technically being controlled by either side. Now, that doesn't mean there's nothing going on here. I would like to show you a sap. I believe that's one coming off the Germans. Uh, there would be... These are largely slit trenches, not terribly deep. But you would have a listening post. You would go out into no man's land. And you'd have to go out there in a shell hole very often, or you'd dig yourself a foxhole. <clears throat> of course, your enemy knows you're there, and they'll go shell you and shoot you, if they possibly can. So you place men out there in no man's land, 
largely is listening posts. You can learn a lot by listening. A lot of the activity is going to take place in the dark. The laying of barbed wire, which I'll talk about in a little while, takes place largely after dark. So your enemy can't see what you're doing. If your enemy's pulling a trench raid, you know, you run across and throw a few hand grenades in and grab somebody, uh, sneak back out. Why, why would you bother? Well, men are going to die. It's a very, very dangerous thing to do. But if you can grab somebody from your opposing armies, that person knows a lot. It's a matter of intelligence. But if your enemy is preparing to attack or preparing some, <clears throat> some kind of maneuver and you have a listening post out there, there's a much better chance that you have a good idea what's going on. Of course, we have men out in there to patrol the area to, to show how, shall I say, how strong you are. Any event, we have barbed wire and landmines. Oh, do I need to go back to the, okay. Well, I'm bringing this up because I might want to refer to it as we continue our discussion. I've already got that. Well, that's wasting your time and being redundant here. Let's go to this without having it photographs taken from above so we can discuss a little bit more what the trenches were like. One thing else I want to point out here is barbed wire. Barbed wire is an American invention. Uh, barbed wire is obviously developed in, for the American to control cows and sheep. And you have something there that's relatively light. It's not certainly going to stop the wind. And this will keep your cattle or your sheep from, go, from leaving various areas. The, sometimes these barbed wire is set up to keep from trench raids and keep your enemy from attacking. If you're attacking into barbed wire, you're getting nowhere. Uh, this will grab onto your clothing, this will tangle you up, it'll cut your skin. If you're going to attack an enemy, there's two things you have to do. First of all, you have to clear the path from your barbed wire so you can get out. And now you've got to find a way of removing the enemy's barbed wire <clears throat> so you can actually get in and assault their positions. It's a remarkable device as far as defense is concerned. <clears throat> Here's a World War I joke for you. World War I joke. There's not many of them. It's not a real funny thing that's going on. Anyway, supposedly two men are talking. One guy says, how long will the war last? The other guy says, 55 years. 55 years? Yeah, five years to fight the war and 50 years to roll up all the barbed wire. I have been to Verdun, I'll mention that to you later. This is over 100 years ago. And now you see the barbed wire is still there in some places. Now it's old and rusty by now. One thing you don't want to do is get cut on that because you could get blood poisoning. But barbed wire, even 100 years later, could still do you severe damage. Sometimes they're, they're literally seas of barbed wire. You can see how extensive this. Now, this is probably an Allied or British trench. But you can see that, of course, this man's trying to get across. He has a border going across that. And these posts are here, as you can see, to hold up the wire. Sometimes that's not even necessary. Usually barbed wire comes in coils. They, they coil the barbed wire around a stick. So it has a natural bend to it. If you just simply unroll that, then the wire is coiled up. 
And that can be something that will keep you from going forward. Once again, you, th that's a little bit easier to negotiate because if you put a few boards across this, then guys can run across. We do read, read about this happening. You see coils of barbed wire. Guy yells to his buddy, well, it's barbed wire is here. Follow me. And he jumps on the barbed wire. You can imagine how unpleasant that would be. You know, jabbed all over. <clears throat> and then have somebody run across you. They jump on your back, of course, driving the barbs a little bit deeper into your skin. And that's a brave and courageous kind of thing to do. But this is a very, very big factor in how we're going to fight the war on the Western Front. Now, I said this is probably a British trench. How are you going to get these poles into the ground? If you dug a hole and you drop the pole in and then you push the dirt around it, all the opposition would have to do is literally walk up, kick it over, and the wire's going over. So, so you pound it in. Uh, very, very, very dangerous. You're doing this at nighttime, of course, so you cannot be observed. But your enemy, the Germans listening over here and going, here, pound, pound, pound. Oh, by the way, so, um, let's call artillery. They're out there again. They're putting up barbed wire. When they're pounding, it's shell. Send a few shells over there. Send bombardment. Open with machine guns. It's very, very dangerous. The British and French never really learned how to take care of this. By that I mean how to solve this. One of the ways they would do this is they'd have to pound them in. As I was mentioning, you pound them in, they're much more firm. But how can you do that without making a lot of noise? What you do is sometimes you get cloth, blanket, um, you get canvas, you kind of make it thick. And so you have somebody holding the pole, somebody essentially holding the cloth, the blanket on top of that, as some guy with the mallets going whack, 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 that. Well, that doesn't take away all the noise, but can we say it cuts down quite a bit? So sometimes, actually, when you are doing these things, things you're laying wire, that you're going to send up machine gun fire, not necessarily that you're hitting anything, but you're making noise. Uh, martyrs, mortars, and shell going over, so the Germans won't be able to listen and hear you. The Germans are a little bit better at this. They have a, a kind of a screw mechanism. I'm not sure I can show you a German trench during the First World War. Submarines, well, that's not even close to what I want. Let's go over here to... So I can show you the German barbed wire. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the Germans have a screw mechanism. It's metal. <clears throat> and rather than having to pound it in, you simply screw it in. You screw it in. And that makes very little noise. And then you string the wire through the loops in this screw. So in this case, the Germans, shall we say, we're using this a little bit better. Landmines. Landmines actually are used more extensively in the Second World War. In the First World War, you, you place landmines out there. Now, one of the issues with landmines is that if you're trying to take them out and you're shelling your enemy position, and the enemy position has landmines on it, well, shelling them will remove the landmines because the shake of the earth will set them off. They are there. They do kill men. Can we say, under the circumstances of, shall we say, warfare, where you have always, almost always have a heavy barrage going on, that they are not nearly as big of a problem. There's firing going on all the time. Remember, I'm talking about barrage. I mean, literally all day long, somebody's lobbing a shell over. And during heavy bombardments, of course, you have numerous guns shell shelling a relatively small area very rapidly over hours and sometimes even days. One estimate on how many shells were fired in the war. 800 million. That is such a staggering number. This I, I can't even get my, my mind around this. I mean, it's absolutely huge. 
And yes, even today, over 100 years after the war, they're still finding ordnance, unexploded ordinances, on the former battlefields in France. Sometimes the French tractors, when they're going out plowing these, plowing these fields, they actually have metal underneath the tractors in the unfortunate possibility, though it might be remote, of setting off some of this ordnance as you're plowing your field. It's just going to give you a pretty good jolt, but it probably won't destroy your tractor and kill you. Even to this day, the French government is still going out, pulling off unexploded, unexploded ordnance to keep the danger of killing somebody, shall we say, as minimal as possible. An estimate, I don't know how you would know this. I'll give, it, give this to you for your interest. 15% are duds. What does that mean? 100 million are duds? Duds means they don't go off, but that doesn't mean that the ordnance, the explosive material inside of these things has become inert even after 100 years. Remember we talked earlier about artillery pieces, that they are the biggest killer during the war. If we look at the fatalities on the Western Front, for the entirety of the war, of course, we're going to have battles. We'll talk about Somme and Ypres. We'll talk about Passchendaele. We'll talk about Verdun. There's a lot of very big battles going on where the fatalities, the casualties are huge. They're very, very large. But even without that, about 30,000 men per die per month on the Western Front without a battle. What's that, 1,000 men a day? This is general wastage. This is some guy who got exposed. Somebody saw him and got a machine gun on him or a sniper got him. Or an artillery shell comes over. Artillery shells can miss. And they can miss the trenches. But very often they hit the trench. Somebody there, you're dead. These occasional shells. As I mentioned, when you do have a battle, it goes up dramatically. The, the number of fatalities go up dramatically. Let me say something about when we calculate the number of fatalities in battles. Sometimes we say, okay, there's this battle. It lasts from here to here, and we look at these casualties. And as I've already mentioned, they can be very high. Very often they are. Well, some historians want to say, well, yeah, we can look at those. But what would have been the wastage in that same area if there had been no battle? You see, men are constantly fighting. Men are killed every day, but you don't really call the battle unless there's a huge number of attacks. But fighting goes on all the time. I already mentioned the trench raids. You see, some historians want to say, well, this is the number of men died in the battle, but we have to subtract the men who have died there normally. I mean, there's, there's one study I read that said, looking at the average British soldier, well, he's only in battle five days out of the year on the average on the Western Front. I find that number a little bit low, but why are you defining as battle? Is, does battle actually mean that you're actually in, in running out with a gun against a German machine gun? But you're seeing trenches being shelled, is that not a battle? Men die every day. There's combat going on every day. Artillery, machine guns, snipers, and trench raids. I talked about this a little bit when we were mentioning no man's land just a few minutes ago. Why do you do this? I mean, even though the Germans are, are, are sitting back and saying, well, we really don't want to <clears throat> engage the enemy because we're holding on. On the other hand, you want to have people have the trench mentality. That when you do want these men to move, in fact, they will not move. They're not used to moving. It's out of their psyche. One of the reasons why you have the goings-on in, in no man's land, patrolling, trench raids, observing, is to keep the offensive spirit. You were up and were moving with, with your men. Can we say that this is one of the most devastating experiences the men talk about? I remember reading a man's autobiography. This is about the Korean War, but it's, it, I think it fits very well in this case as well. During the Korean War, as I'm sure you know, 
The Chinese are on the hills over here. The Americans are on the hills down here. That's how we fought the last two years of the war. And there's these silly raids. I call them silly because they're military, militarily inconsequential. You, you attack a hill, you grab a hill. And sometimes you patrol between the hills, between the, the Chinese and the Americans. Go down. I'm reading this, reading this man's autobiography. He's talking about when he went on one of these things. And he said, I gave the most fervent prayer in my life. The most, I never prayed so fervently in my entire life. Not that I would live, but that I would die quickly. The experience is so horrific on many men of the First World War. They often talk about that as sometimes the times when they suffered the most psychologically in the war itself. So take a, I'm going to get on to poison gas in just one minute. Let me take uh, another look at the trenches. The areas of the, let's go to the Western Front again. Up here, there's, we're going to read about a lot of mud up here. That's really quite bad. Seas of mud, this is most famous in 1917 with the Battle of Passchendaele, or Third Epoch, which we'll discuss later. But this is a, a muddy area, and the, and the water tables are very high. <clears throat> when the water tables are very high, you do have trenches. But on either side of the trench, you do have a tendency to build it up. In other words, if you build it up, of course, you'll be standing in the water anyway, unfortunately. But if you build it up, then you're not going to have quite as much, much problem with water. In the other areas, virtually the rest of the Western Front, we have a very good soil based on what we call chalk. Okay. Chalk is actually limestone. Like I say, it's very good soil. France has very good agriculture, as do other countries like Britain, who their soil is based on chalk. Now you have the foliage on top. <clears throat> there is no place on the Western Front, actually, where they actually have woods, but in no man's land, essentially between the trenches. The normal area before, shall we say, human beings come in and start cutting down trees for farmland, the normal plants you see all over Northern Europe are trees. Even yet, if you quit farming area, you walk away for a few years, you got trees. The trees have been gone for centuries, except in small groves in various places. <clears throat> the Germans and the British and the French have a tendency not to have tr not have the trees in the middle of no man's land. So the fire is really more general. But let's take a look at the chalk. You get rid of the topsoil and you go into the ground and now you, yeah, you have this chalk. Going back to our trench. You see, this, of course, this is not a color photograph. Black and white, obviously, obviously an aerial photograph taken during the war. Notice what we see here. We see shell holes. The German trenches here have been plastered. You can see the trench, but all of this white is where the shells had blown away the plants on top, exposing the soil underneath. If you're advancing and you have a trench raid or you're patrolling out here, shell hole to shell hole is a very good idea. But look at the extent of how this has been plastered. Of course, some of this, I'm being, shall we say, a little bit overly simplistic. Some of this, of course, are the Germans actually throwing the dirt out. But most of this is shells. So what does a trench look like? I don't know what I'm there for. Here's one of my favorite trench photographs. These are Canadians. Uh, this is taken during the daytime. Uh, can I get a larger view of that? Probably not. These are Canadians. They're fighting with the British. Obviously, that man's looking toward the German trench, or facing toward the German trench. You can see the trench level right here, about right there. If he sticks his head up right there, they'll kill him. A sniper will take him out. So he's down here and he's kind of bobbing up to see uh, a little bit what's going on. Now, sometimes they have periscopes where you could stand down here, look through the periscope, 
and you get a clear view without having to expose yourself. Can't quite see this well, but there are, uh, I apologize, uh, there's a man right here who is trying to sleep. He's got his helmet on and he's, you know, you got your neck crooked over like that to that point. That's got to be enormously uncomfortable. You're only going to sleep that way if you're completely fatigued and under stressful situation. There are two men laying down right here under these, these boards, essentially. They did this. They, they, they would put heavy boards across the top of the trenches to give people some shelter from shelling. But there's not enough of these to really make a difference to what the, what's happening here. And there's two men laying asleep here. Once again, this is a daytime shot, but these men are obviously trying to get what, what they can, whatever sleep they can, which goes to fatigue. You have these men are under foot inspection. Later on, we'll be talking about the psychological impact of the war, the human experience. I'll talk more about trench foot. The reason why I'm showing you this is you, when you're walking around, you see these are duck boards down here. If there's water in the trench, you don't want to be standing in the water more than you have to, though many men have to nonetheless. Uh, and you're, these men are standing up almost, almost straight. So unless a shell comes over, uh, uh, a machine gun probably won't hit you. So it's deep enough that you will not be hit. But sometimes the firing line, you want to be able to stand up to use your weapons. And you can stand up here. And of course, you can have your rifle right there or a machine gun position. And you can fire out there. To a certain extent, this photograph right here, you got duck boards again, you're walking across here. But the firing line, if this man wanted to stand up, which is very dangerous under this scenario, you could have a number of men firing across there. So you say this is typical. This is not as elaborate as some of the other trenches that we're going to see during the war. But let's talk in terms of chalk. The men are going to be dirty with chalk. On the northern areas, you're going to be simply splattered with mud. Let me talk about poison gas. One of the, I would call it a terror weapon, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. That was used in the First World War. <clears throat> I've read this in books. Once again, you can't believe everything you read, but I'm not going to ignore everything I read. That there are allegations that the British used this, this poison gas during the Boer War of 1899 and 1902. Well, allegations doesn't, doesn't mean, how did you use it? I wanted to find out the scenario in which they were used. I want to find why they were used. And I want to find the kind of gas that was used. I did all of these searches. I went in, books on the Boer War, looked through them. I didn't read them all. Looked through them. I couldn't find it. However, I believe they said the, the British were using cordite. And that goes in, into shells. Well, when I'm reading that, are you really talking about using a poison gas? Are you really talking about what goes into shells? Maybe I shouldn't bring this up because it's very misleading. I really don't think this happened. So the first time we actually read about using gas, in wartime is First World War. Now, France uses tear gas in 1914. Remember going back, we were discussing this earlier about the, it's illegal according to Hague Conventions to use gas from shells. Doesn't really say if you're using cylinders. Remember this is quibbling. The French uses tear gas. Is tear gas technically a lethal substance? Well, I guess you've got enough of it down in your lungs. It, it could probably kill you. But it's really an irritant. I, I think, I, I'm glad I've never had this experience being around it. Uh, I, I understand you're nauseous, you throw up, you're, you, you're, you, you, you uh, slobber because 
your body's trying to get get it out of your mouth. You can't see. Your eyes are running down. See, this can be debilitating, not necessarily killing. It doesn't necessarily kill you. There's going to be a controversy about this during the excuse me, I said that wrong during the Vietnam War because during the Vietnam War, in order to get the Americans, in order to get the, their enemies out of the tunnels, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, you they do use tear gas to get them out rather than sending some guy down there. <laughs> or a bomb to blow everybody up, we can get them to come out by using tear gas. Is this breaking the laws of war? Well, probably not. At least there was a discussion in Vietnam, and most people said, nah, it's not really breaking the laws of war. The Germans actually use gas in shells. Lethal gas in shells on the Russian front in January 1915. We say it's largely an experiment, see if, see if it'll work. It doesn't work. It's not like there isn't gas in the shells. But it goes over and hits, and of course, when the shells explode, all the gas is released. The, the Russians don't even know they've been hit with this. It's too cold. It is so cold on the Russian front that when these gas shells break open, the gas kind of just lays on the ground. Uh, doesn't dissipate or spread out as it would have to do to do real damage. The first major use of gas in the First World War is the Second Battle of Ypres on April 22nd, 1945. The Germans are going to use this. Now, it is very, very important to remember in gas warfare particularly if, you, if you're releasing the gas from cylinders. You've got to follow the wind patterns. On the Western Front, remember this is Northern Hemisphere, in the Northern Hemisphere the prevailing wind patterns are from West to East. As you look at, I don't know why I like the weather, like they say everybody talks about the weather but nobody does anything about it. I like to watch the weather. <clears throat> I'm from Utah, boring weather, sunny, warm every day. Nonetheless, when storms do come in, they come from the west. The weather patterns come from the west. This is important not only in gas warfare, but it's also going to be important in aerial warfare. I'll come back and talk about this later. You're caught in a dogfight over here, and the wind is going to have a tendency to drift you over toward Germany. That can be disconcerting to have the allies. Can we say that's somewhat to the advantage of the Germans because they don't mind being <laughs> having uh, their, their, the wind essentially cause them to drift in this direction. We'll talk about aerial warfare later. On the ground, of course, you know, it swirls and there are times when, when the wind can blow in different directions. But there are prevailing wind patterns. If you look anywhere in the United States, probably anywhere in the world, and you look at major airports and you'll see the runways go in various directions. They go in various directions because of prevailing wind patterns. The big birds, the jets taking off, they want to take up, take off into the wind, not against the wind. And not only this, they don't want to have a lot of wind coming in from the side that can destabilize the craft as it's taking off. In Northern Europe, even on ground level, there is a tendency for the prevailing wind patterns to be west to east. So if you're using gas, the Germans are going to have to wait for a good day when the swirling air patterns are going from east to west, not west to east, because it'll blow back on them. There are instances when people are using this and the, and the wind pattern changes. There are times when the Germans release gas and it blows back on them. There's times when the British and the French release gas and it blows back on them. Well, what are they using? They're using chlorine. We see chlorine somewhat. I haven't, I haven't been to a, a swimming, swimming pool in a very lengthy period of time. 
Well, when I was younger, until my back started giving me grief, I used to swim all the time. In fact, I, during my noon hours, so I'd go down to the pool and I'd do laps and try to stay in shape, not just my legs from walking or running, but, you know, the entire body. And they use chlorine in the water as a means of killing bacteria. So if somebody's sick, everybody jumps in the pool, not everybody gets sick. And you're in the water a little while, and if you're not wearing goggles, it, it's irritating you. It bothers you a little, it bothers your eyes. So when you come out swimming, your eyes are all red, that kind of thing. So we are familiar with chlorine as something that is often used to purify water. However, chlorine in heavy concentrations is debilitating and quite frankly, it can be, it can be lethal. What chlorine does is this. <clears throat> it's an irritant. If you breathe it in, it gets in your lungs and it irritates your lungs. So your lungs are trying to expel it. So your lungs are producing a lot of fluid. You produce a lot of fluid and you try to cough it out. And when you cough it out, sometimes it clears out, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, it kills you. So that's, that's essentially how it kills you. Chlorine is green. You can see it. Right, let's see. Let's see if I can get a gas attack for you. World War One. Okay. Some of these are quite famous photographs. Perhaps one of the more famous one of them all. These are British troops that have been gassed. Uh, of course, not only does chlorine bother your, your lungs, bothers your eyes, phosgene is even worse, and I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. Uh, these men are, are going back for treatment. What I wanted to show you was an aerial view. Let's try this again. and put this is what I want to show you you see these this is gas being released by canisters and uh, what I can't tell you is the uh, which side is using this now chlorine is green you can see it so when you're, when you're faced with a chlorine attack, you look out and you see a green cloud. Whoa, you got a problem. You better do something about it pretty fast. On the first attack, April 22nd, some of the colonial troops are actually bug out. But the same cloud hits the Canadians. I guess the Canadians are technically colonial troops. These men are very, very good. How do you understand this? I know a few Canadians. They seem like regular people. In World War I, they are exceptional human beings. Some of them run. I'm not saying they don't. As awful as this is, as debilitating as this is, some of them actually stay in the trenches. You know, coughing, blubbering, pain in the eyes. Now, the Germans actually... Were, the, were not expecting it to be as successful as it was. It was very successful. Not only did some men run, but the men who are staying there are uh, not as fighting as well as you normally expect them to do. So when, the, when it comes over, the Germans do send up attack troops. Of course, there's a problem as well, because you can actually be running into the gas, your own gas. It, likely had they actually had a larger number of troops concentrated on a small area because of the shock effect and the fact that the Canadians and the British don't know what to do, the Germans might, might could have made a significant breakthrough. Now that didn't happen, of course, when, when the first gas attack takes place, there's a big problem. What are, what are we going to do? Because the Germans might do it again. I thought I saw a photograph here of men 
They inframize, here we go. They inframize, these are early gas masks. These are obviously Scots because of their caps. And you, you, you grab cloth, any kind of cloth, really. Cotton cloth is better because it's easier to breathe through. But you've got to have something that will filter out anything that's coming in. Now, since chlorine is active, that's why it's there. It'll kill you, right? Uh, it, will, it tends to react with things very rapidly. That's why it's bothering your lungs. So sometimes the men are told that the socks are made out of wool. You might have a pair of socks if you're very careful. And if you're not, well, you can take the socks off your feet. And you urinate in these things. The uric acid will react with the chlorine. Now, I, I'm not saying the smell here is pleasant at all, but you can put that on your mouth and that will give you some protection. Of course, later on, you start developing gas masks. And the gas masks tend to have carbon in them. Sometimes we call it coke. As you know from your chemistry, carbon is a very active element. There's carbon, in fact, sometimes we say, we are carbon-based life forms because carbon is involved in virtually all the atoms and molecules in our bodies. And that's true of many other living things on the earth as well. It's active. So when you breathe, once again, the smell's not terribly pleasant, but when you breathe through that, you're sucking the air and the, act, the active ingredient, the chlorine itself, reacts with the carbon and that neutralizes the air. We have gas masks down here. These are Germans, and the German gas masks, are, are, of course, are considered to be among the best. Now, why on earth would Germany do this? Well, it's a desperation measure. See, Germany is one of the countries that is trying to look forward to using their industry and their technology to their best advantage before the First World War. The chemical industry of Germany is probably the most advanced in the world. I'm going to mention this later, at least I should, that the Germans don't have enough chemicals for fertilizers, among other things, the beginning of the First World War. And the Germans have to improvise and use substitutes. Find something that is not really what you want, but it's something that will act the same way. It's one of the reasons the Germans are able to keep up their uh, military industry, their, their, their military abilities, is by the use of the chemical industry. One of these is the use of gas. I believe chlorine can be made from ammonia, and the Germans produce ammonia, and so you make chlorine from ammonia. Well, chlorine is important. It kills people. But then we go to phosgene. Phosgene is perhaps the most lethal, though mustard gas is pretty bad as well. Can we say it is, in one book I read says like a hundred times more lethal than is chlorine. You see, we have to be careful on what kind of chemicals you use in a gas attack. If the gas is light, it just goes up in the atmosphere. If the gas is heavy, it just goes down and lays. If the gas has to be, shall we say, a certain density, and of course it has to be an active molecule, so it will combine with chemicals in your body and kill you. Phosgene, and there's not just one kind of phosgene. They keep on playing, the chemists keep on playing with the nature of the <clears throat> chemical itself to make, shall we say, better killing capacity out of the gas itself, but it's colorless and it's most lethal. Sometimes when you look out, uh, phosgene's a little bit heavy. I'm not going to say it just lays on the floor, but can we say sometimes it kind of, like a, uh, a wave of water, it kind of goes over the land like this. One of the ways that the, the Allies and the Germans figure out uh, spreading phosgene better is actually by putting it with chlorine, colorless, it's almost invisible, because it has a tendency to be heavy. It pools and shell holes 
Sometimes it pulls in trenches. So there are the stories about the guys in the trenches that are not well informed. You see men up on top, higher levels of the trench, or on top of the trench, and they're going, well, I'm glad, I'm glad it's all clear now. So the guys in the trenches go, well, it's probably good for us too. Well, the phosgene is still down there. Going back to our photograph, back in the trenches now, of gas, therefore, that's why I call this chlorine. If this was phosgene, you probably couldn't see it. There's all there's watch posts. There's men out. Remember these saps out in various areas. When the gas comes over, they ring bells and boy, you better grab your gas mask and get it on fast. Sometimes the French are famous for this. They do use tear gas. Remember they used it in 1914. Sometimes tear gas is also used with phosgene and chlorine. The idea is this: it comes over, and if you're not fast with your getting your mask on, you're nauseous and you're throwing up. You put the mask on your face. You're starting throwing up in there. You either drown in your own vomit, or you're gonna to have to pull this thing off and start breathing the poison gas. Mustard gas. Um, we call it mustard gas. I'm not sure it's technically could be used as gas. It's really a blistering agent. It comes in droplets. It's yellow. <clears throat> the Germans, once again, the chemical industry is very good. The mustard gas is used by a bunch of different people. The Germans use it so, exce so excessively that sometimes you can actually tell where the Germans are going to attack. You see, if they shell an area right here, they have mustard gas all over there, and it's on in the water, it's on the plants, it's on the barbed wire. And you send your man through there, and it touches, it literally touches against your skin. You got a big problem. So you shell an area where you don't want your enemy to be moving. When you move, you want to go to another area. Sometimes we read about the Germans using mustard gas so extensively that you actually see it going down on the tops of streams, literally floating on the top. You cannot release this with canisters, it doesn't go anywhere. So you use it in shells. A common tactic that was used during the First World War is to shell your enemy artillery positions with gas shells. So when they come, so when, I mean, if you just shell them with artillery, with regular artillery shells, you almost have to either knock out the crew or hit the gun itself to take it out of action. However, if you're using a shell coming over there and it's hitting gas shell, I said that wrong, in the area, you got gas in the area, it debilitates men. It, it keeps men from being able to use their guns. Now, of course, when you're on the Western Front, it doesn't take you very long to learn the difference between a shell that's going off and exploding and a shell that goes pop and is releasing gas. And these are, this is very important for your survival. Uh, shell in, in shells, primarily, droplets and blisters. If you have even a small amount of mustard gas, and you prick it on your on your wrist, for example, one guy in the National Guard told me they did this to him. He says, "We're going to show what mustard gas can do to you." And he said they just very small amount. They put it on the back of his hand. That was pretty bad. A big blister, and you had to treat it like like a regular blister. You could imagine you have large large amounts of this, and even it's even more debilitating if it gets in your lungs. I'd like to give you a photograph of men suffering from a mustard gas attack. Yeah, we have various forms of. Gas masks. It's a famous photograph. Germans on their artillery piece. This is probably since, since the angle of the art, it's not artillery, it's machine gun. The angle of this is so high that they're probably using this to fire at aircraft. I wanted to show you a picture, some of these photographs of men in hospitals. 
that are literally covered with these, with these blisters. Extremely painful. Well, what is the actual importance of this to the war itself? And I'm going to come down here and make an argument. The importance is largely overrated. Even though it's used, it's, I know this is a bad pun, it's an irritant. It's clearly that. <clears throat> if you're sitting around with a gas mask on, even though you're going to suck in some air, your ability to run around is, can we say, quite limited. It's psychologically disturbing. You're sitting in a mask. You have your eyepieces. Sometimes your own breath will fog up the eyepieces. You can't see well. You really can't do much of anything. The sounds around you can be somewhat muted as well. You see, this can be disconcerting. But can we say it decides no battle? We cannot say, even after the, the failed uses, at, at the, shall we say, the German failure to follow this up at the Battle of Ypres, Second Battle of Ypres, that uh, it really decides no battle. There's no one battle. There's no one battle we can say that the important issue in deciding the battle is gas. Can it be effective? Yes. Can it be helpful? Yes. But, on the other hand, its importance overrated. As we look at the fatalities during the war, 1% fatalities from gas. I mean, compared to artillery, rifle fire, machine guns, this is, this, from fatality standpoint, this is almost inconsequential. Very little. Very few fatalities, few lingering effects. I remember reading a, reading a study at the end of the First World War in the 1920s. And this is a British study. The, they, men could put in for, for money on the basis of a disability which they received in the war. Now you could imagine the men that were blown apart by shells or lost their legs, <clears throat> rifle fire, they're going to have a lot of problems. However, as we look at the lingering effects, very few, a very, very few number, very, very small percentage of men were applying, applying for disabilities on the basis of gas attacks. One author said this, that rather than looking at gas as one of the great crimes in the war, we should look at it as perhaps more humane. Yeah, there are studies, there are books that will show you, and I try to show you this photograph, this man that's been, been badly burned. These are pretty horrific. Well, what if you did a study of men who were shot with rifle fire? and see what they look like with their faces blown off and holes through their legs. I'm not sure I agree with this. On the other hand, I think there is a point. At, at what level do we actually say how bad gas was? Is it more humane? Well, everything about war is awful. My two bits is if you can outlaw and keep any weapon <laughs> from being used, you're probably doing a pretty good thing. My dad was in the Second World War. He was not deployed in combat, but he went through basic training. Even though gas was not used during the Second World War, there are, were accusations. I don't think any of those have been verified. There are accusations. But dad said that they gave them whiffs of various kinds of gas that so if you smell those in a battlefield situation you could actually react you would know what they were what to do and he said even though mustard gas is is actually a droplet um, phosgene is a better gas but he said when you smelled I believe it's phosgene maybe I'm getting See, see if my memory is correct on this. I'll look this up later. But he said it smelled like newborn hay. Now, you know, Dad was raised on a farm. He knows what hay smells like. And he said, get a whiff of that, and you know you're dealing with, with gas. But this was not used in the Second World War. Speculation, why not? The Germans still have a good chemical industry. Well, Adolf Hitler was gassed in the First World War. 
And it's hard to look at that man's experience and say in any way, shape, or form he ha ever had any moral compunction, because quite frankly, he didn't. But some people speculate, well, maybe he didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't want to use this again, though he had that experience. He never ate meat. Couldn't stand it. After the war, did do something to his taste buds. Maybe. No one smoked in his presence. When he killed himself in 1941, he shot himself. And his one day bride, his wife, took cyanide. The first, one of the first things that his entourage, that his men had been around him, sometimes women, the secretaries went around him. They walked out and said, oh, by the way, Hitler, der Führer, is dead. What they did, they did him. Something he could never do in his presence. Probably because of gas. How many other people suffer these kinds of things, I don't know. But uh, can we say, not smoking is probably good for your health. I'm a little confused. I've got a few minutes left. So I don't want to completely waste your time. So let's talk for a few minutes. Let's, we're talking about kind of the nature of the, of the front. I'm going to talk about that again. We're talking about the psychological impact. But let's start fighting the war a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about casualties. The French have built up their army again after the huge casualties in 1914. Draft age in France was age 21. So one of the first things they do is draft all the men that are 20. Then they draft all the men that are 19. Then they draft all the men that are 18. By 1917, they draft all the boys that are 17. They go as deep as they can. So they're building up, even though they suffered very heavy casualties, they're building up them, they're building up their strength as best they can. As I've already mentioned in a couple of contexts, one thing the French want to do is keep get the Germans off the sacred soil of France. Uh, French attacks. I was in a museum, a history museum in Paris. Been to Paris once back in the 90s. I was teaching on study abroad. We went to Paris. One thing I'm going to do is see a history museum as I possibly can. <clears throat> very, very interesting. Now, my French is, is limited, but there's enough words from French that are similar to English that as I'm looking at the displays about World War I, <clears throat> I can understand pretty well what they're talking about. I remember one of these things. They showed a map of the Western Front in World War I. This was not the map, it's something like that. And they showed what France was doing to win the war, including the various attacks in 1915. They're hitting, the French army is largely down here. The British army is expanding and occupying more and more trenches up here at the same time. So the French are fighting along this area and, and they're showing, you know, you have attacks, heavy casualties. They don't talk so much about the casualties, but you're gaining a few miles. So you're literally punching these little enclaves here. I remember looking at this going, well, okay, you are trying to retake France. And obviously that's something that you shall we say that your mentality demands. On the other hand, the cost was enormous. Uh, and these attacks at Champagne and various areas, you, you hit and you come in and you use your artillery preparations, you use your machine guns, and you rush. Remember, the French believe in Elan. Even in 1915, they're still being aggressive. They're still pushing. Yeah, they get a few miles, but in overall, can we say this doesn't really aid them in winning the war at all? In fact, the battles the French are fighting are literally so costly that uh, they... Some studies have said that for every two Germans that die, three Frenchmen die. So they're suffering a lot more from their attacks than are the Germans. 
let me end with this. New ideas are needed. Okay. You need to have the genius sit down. There are geniuses. I shouldn't say genius on the Western Front, the very clever men on the Western Front. Sit down and figure out, let's, let's rethink this. So rather than going to new ideas, they just refine the old ones. Well, okay, the artillery barrage didn't work. Well, let's adjust the artillery barrage. Let's have it more intense. Let's have it even more narrow. Rather than shelling, shelling the trenches, let's start shelling the support area. We get the roving barrage. I'm not sure how why this was terribly effective. Anyway, you'd go out and and you're shelling an area, and you'd move it back and forth, largely in, in support areas or the secondary trenches. You have the intensity of fire going back and forth. This is commonly used for for a very lengthy period of time on the on the front. In fact, it's almost used throughout the war. I'm not really sure why that's superior than just sending your your shells your your shells where you want them to be. I, I guess maybe if you don't have any targets roving around and seeing if you accidentally hit something uh, is can be somewhat justified. On the other hand, if you don't have any targets, you better find some. We need new ideas and we really don't have them. And I apologize because I've gone over. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.